that was the main reason for doing it, and then solving magnetic issues for the random system. But what Eric pointed out was that one can actually now consider what happens in the disordered case because we have a parameterization of how the hopping integral for these random dopants varies with the distance between the dopants. So the next thing that he did was uh, use the bandwidths of the calculated lower and upper Hubbard band for the lattice case to get to determine the hopping parameter for the lower Hubbard band and the hopping parameter for the upper Hubbard band, which are not identical in this problem. Uh, uh, dis distribute the centers randomly and calculate the Hubbard bands using actual t's to nearest neighbors obtained from a Wigner sites construction for each site. So only nearest neighbor hopping, but in the random case, the nearest neighbors are defined by those that are, if you do a Voronoi construction, which are the nearest neighbors are defined that way. So many have five, some have seven, on average they have six. I mean, he, most of the calculations we did um, uh, uh, for the magnetic problem were in two dimensions, but uh, here he actually did a three-dimensional calculation of the density of, uh, density of states. And so what you find is that, uh, and what, I, what you can uh, show is that in the large valley degeneracy limit, when you don't have to worry about exchange issues because the electron in the upper Hubbard band is in a normally in a different valley and different spin state than the one in the down one. So of course in silicon it's the six valleys and two uh, spin states, so there are 12 different states, uh, but uh, conceptually it is in the infinite valley uh, degeneracy limit. You don't have to worry about exchange and then you can just do the calculation as a one electron problem both in the bottom and in the top upper Hubbard band. And then you can calculate the density of states that you get. Here's the density in units of the mod density, a tenth of the mod density. This is the density of states of the lower Hubbard band. You can see the upper Hubbard band is broader uh, than the, and these are the 5% and 95% points. See, because this is randomly distributed, they have, there are long tails. So we will use the 5% uh, occupation, the 95% occupation as to denoting the band edges, nominal band ed edges for the two bands. That's what happens if the density is raised to 0.5 of the mod density. Uh, they are asymmetric bands. They are not, uh, uh, and then finally, 1.2 times the mod density. They are pretty much overlapping at that stage. Okay. So this is just uh, a calculation of the density of states. But we can do more than that. If it's a one electron calculation, we can actually calculate the mobility edge because we can take our sample and ch change the boundary conditions and see from the sensitivity of the change in energy uh, from periodic to anti-periodic boundary condition uh, when it is compared with the energy level spacing, this ratio, dimensionless ratio, gives you the dimensionless conductance in units of e squared over h, that's the Thaulis conductance. And so we can plot the Thaulis conductance for different sizes uh, and that shows the location of the mobility edge. Let me show you what the data looks like. So what's being plotted here is the Thaulis conductance versus energy, and this is concentrating on the lower band, and this is concentrating on the upper band. And what you see is that at very low energies in the tail, as you increase the size of the system, the Thaulis conductance goes down, suggesting it's going to go to an insulator in the thermodynamic limit, whereas here, it's a three-dimensional system, and the Thaulis conductance increases with size, and goes heads off to infinity as expected for an ohmic uh, conductor. And so the crossing point shows you where the mobility edge is. And this shows that the lower upper Hubbard band has two mobility edges and so does the upper Hubbard band, except I haven't plotted the second one. So you locate the mobility edges as a result of this calculation. So here then now we can show the bands, energy versus the density. This is on a linear plot now. Um, and what you find is the 95% and 95% um, are plotted here for both the bands. And these are the mobility edges within the, the two bands. Okay. So it says very clearly that around the mod density, there are no, uh, the whole center of the uh, two band uh, manifold is all conducting and therefore clearly it's metallic there, but it's not the crossing of these two mobility edges that determines the metal insulator transition density. It's when the Fermi level crosses the mobility edge. And as you can see here, the Fermi level is sitting somewhere there in between 
the upper band and the lower band, and it continues going there. So in fact, what we find from this example, this calculation, is that the random system ought to have gotten metallic much, much earlier. Let's see whether that, how that compares with experiment. In particular, we can calculate the uh, activation energy from the Fermi level to the nearest mobility edge. That tells us the activation energy that you would get for a, for, um, in conductivity measurements. And we plot the activation gap as a function of NAB cubed. Just for uh, NAB cubed is 0 0.016 for the Mott transition. AB is the Bohr radius, N is the density. And we plot this now on a linear scale. And the data we get for, from the random calculation is this solid line. And it seems to go to zero roughly at half the Mach density. Whereas the dashed line is a calculation for the lattice. For some strange reason, which we don't understand, it's almost a straight line on this linear, linear plot. And here is the original data of the dielectric constant plotted uh, uh, as the green squares and the blue, uh, the blue x's and the purple uh, from different uh, groups. And this is the data of, for the activation energy from various groups for conductivity. And you see that we do a pretty good job of, of the activation energy down to pretty close to where, where we would suggest that it should go metallic. And if you look at the experiment, it also seems to suggest that, but then the activation energy is small, but not particular. It's extremely small and not uh, hardly measurable. The error bars in here are very large because the activation energy is small. And there's a lot of variable range hopping that comes in in this entire regime. This regime is not corrupted by vari variable range hopping, but this is corrupted. But in any case, if you look at the experiment, something that has not been recognized, I think, to date is that it looks like it's going to get become a metallic, then suddenly hangs up, and for another factor of two in density, it stays insulating. So there are clearly sort of two regimes of insulator. This is what I would call a Hubbard insulator with a large activation energy, and this one more like an Anderson um, uh, efros slavsky coulomb gap insulator. So. Um, No, it may be just it may be just uh, a coincidence. I don't know why that. No, no, no. It's not all silicon phosphorus. There's germanium. There is uh, uh, no. These are all silicon data, but we have data from germanium, dope germanium. But one thing that is very clear is that there is a total lack of data in this regime. Uh, we I we combed the literature as much as we could. And what we find is that this is really old data mostly, um, you know, 70s, 60s, maybe some 80s. Uh, and that, that seems to agree with, the da uh, with our uh, calculation pretty well. But then the data in here is really needs good data analysis to do. These are classic experiments, don't need very, very low temperatures. All you need is samples. What about That's what you get from, uh, from oh, sorry. The dielectric constant is basically from the optical data. Yeah, that's what we're getting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Between half and. Well, we've, we have done a lot of magnetic experiments in that regime. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, those are on those samples, right. But the question is, there wasn't much transport done on those samples, unfortunately. OK. So the question, uh, concluding this part, is really an enigma. Uh, the behavior of gap obtained from dielectric enhancement, uh, the average gap is well described by the average structure, a cubic lattice with some coordination number. Uh, the conductivity activation gap is well described for one half the critical density, but then must have a sharp change in behavior. Both the experiment and the theory seems to suggest that. And the question is why? 
So one obvious uh, thing is that we need band repulsion, which we haven't put in our model. We calculate the two bands quite separately and don't include hybridization with, between the bands. That is one possibility. But to me, that seems unlikely to, to stabilize it for such a long distance. It must have some effect, but maybe not uh, by enough, by itself. The two other possibilities are long-range Coulomb interaction stabilizes the insulating phase from point 0.6 NC to NC. The, some of the other Coulomb interactions are responsible for stabilizing the insulating phase. How it does it, don't know. That I asked, after I had uh, several discussions with Boris Shlovsky and uh, uh, asking him for suggestions for what we could do, but got nothing. So uh, that it remains a, uh, an enigma. The other possibility which um, I'm beginning to feel also plays a role or maybe plays a um, major role is that this, is, this system somehow throws away magnetism completely, whereas we know that the magnetic behavior of the insulating phase is extremely well described by a valence bond glass. That's, there's lots of singlets happening uh, in the system, and that singlet stabilization somehow or the other is lifting the um, um, mobility edge more than this calculation shows, and that's why the insulating phase is stabilized. In any case, more systematic experimental data on this gap is definitely needed. Question. Yeah. Can we go back to your next yeah. Which one? Next one. Next one. This one. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So here is pretty much Curie-like. Okay. We are talking about densities with some corrections. Okay. This area is where the uh, random singlet uh, phenomenon seems to occur a lot. And this entire phase from here to almost to point two is well described by that, that kind of phenomenology. If you take one parameter um, uh, from the, uh, to fit the experiment, you can fit the magnetization, you fit the specific heat, you can, uh, you can fit the susceptibility, all with one parameter. Ma and yeah, this is the Hartley calculation, right. So it's clear that that is important in this regime and how it affects this, uh, how to incorporate that into the Hubbard type calculation and to get the mobility edge uh, is an open outstanding question, I think. Okay, now to the other half, which is Anderson localization. Uh, so the other viewpoint of the metal insulator transition an abstract paper by Anderson in 1958 for which he got the Nobel Prize is just a one electron problem. What you have is a Hamiltonian that's uh, on-site energies that are distributed independently, randomly in this what's called the box distribution or uniform distribution between minus W over 2 and plus W over 2 and a hopping on a, uh, and the particular case we are going to consider is a bipartite d-dimensional lattice, so something like simple cubic or square or, or linear chain or higher dimension if you want. And the cartoon for the solution, since this is a one electron problem, you can just diagonalize it. It's an n by n matrix that you have to diagonalize for b big sizes and you can do that. And the cartoon is the density of states for three dimensions uh, is the density, famous density of states of a simple cubic uh, tight binding model with its Van Hoff singularities. And then the expectation has been that when you go disorder it, this rounds out these Van Hoff singularities. You get a density of states which is basically featureless with uh, localized states in the tail for intermediate values of W. And as you increase W, this thing be make this broader and broader, uh, all the states get localized, but the density of states remains featureless. There's only one parameter in the problem, that is the ratio of W over V. And so I will be using that um, as a number um, in much of the, many of the slides. So that's when you see W equals a number, it means that that's the ratio of W over V, the hopping integral. I'm using Anderson's original notation. Uh, nowadays, people use T for that. Okay. Now, the phase diagram in three dimension uh, of the, uh, uh, as a function of uh, um, uh, energy, and disorder is uh, plotted here. And what you find is that uh, 
you have for zero disorder, of course, you have an ext um, extended states all the way up to the edge, which is six times V, um, the two ZV. And uh, then the extended band remains in this regime. But if you go to um, energies outside or very large disorder, um, it goes to Z. Um, you only get localized states. So this is for different kinds of disorder. This is uh, box distribution, Gaussian distribution, Lorentz distribution, et cetera, et cetera. But the, this is only in three dimensions. In two dimensions of, and one dimension, what you have is basically extended states along this line up to the bandage and localized states everywhere else. So the assumption has always been that this insulating phase is just trivial or boring, or maybe it's too hard to calculate. So let's not worry about it. Well, we, um, we ended up trying to, uh, Sonica ended up learning how to do transfer matrix calculations and also the exact diagonalization calculation just as a trial warm-up exercise, and we ended up finding something that uh, uh, seemed interesting. So let me go through what we did. So there are two ways to explore the Anderson model numerically. One is you just exactly diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Um, in one of the ways uh, you, can, uh, you can look at the nature of the eigenstate is what's known as the inverse participation ratio, which is basically for any given state, you look at the, its amplitude at a given site i to the fourth power, sum over all the sites, uh, divided by the normalization factor, the same number of powers of psi. And what you can quickly convince yourself that if you have an extended state for a si system of size n, then this ratio is 1 over n. On the other hand, if you have a localized state, then you get 1 over the number of sites on which the localized state exists. Basically, it distributes psi i is 1 over the square root of the number of sites on which it exists. And therefore, this is a finite number in the case of localized states, independent of the size of the system. And it scales with the size of the system in the extended state. Now, uh, the number of sites scales as the dth power of the localization length, just dimensions. And therefore, in 1D, this is 1 over psi. So if you look at the inverse participation ratio versus energy for uh, the Anderson model, this is done for a very small disorder, W equals 1. Remember the bandwidth. Uh, this is one dimension, uh, 1D uh, Anderson model. So the bandwidth is, in this case, is 2. And uh, uh, sorry, uh, 4, 4 in this case. And so W equals 1 is really small disorder. And what you find is the inverse participation ratio is large, suggesting a quite localized state uh, in one over roughly eight sites or something like that here, 10 sites here. But by the time you get to the center of the band, it's really localized on a, over 100 sites. And so you really need big size systems like 500 or 1,000 to converge the data. You notice that 500 and 1,000 are sitting on top of each other, but 100 is different, and so is 50. But you can you see this behavior where the states are more uh, sort of localized with long localization length here and s short localization length here. Another way of uh, looking at the uh, Anderson model is to use transfer matrix methods. What you do is you uh, calculate the actually find out the amplitude of the wave function on site i plus one from the amplitudes on the previous two sites using a transfer matrix, which is just this particular uh, uh, matrix. It's E minus the Hamiltonian of the site and the identity there. And then by looking at the eigenvalues of the uh, product of these transfer matrices to the, as, as you increase the size of the system, you can extract the localization length from the minimum eigenvalue. This is known as the Lyapunov exponent. So this is another way of extracting the um, localization length. So one would expect that the Lyapunov exponent, which is also going as 1 over psi, will be very much the same as the inverse participation ratio. And that's what you actually see. One of these is uh, the red is the Lyapunov exponent as a function of energy. And the blue is the inverse participation ratio. Of course, they're not identical, but they're propor pretty much proportional to each other uh, in this regime of energy. Okay. And this is for W equals 4. 
However, if you go further, what you find is something rather dramatic, that first of all, as you go towards the edge, the inverse participation ratio goes down, whereas the Lyapunov exponent keeps on going up. And the reason for this is something that I will I'll show you uh, in the next couple of slides. But also notice that the way in which it goes doesn't seem to be a smooth function. There seems to be some features in this, in this curve, which I'll also remark on later. So one question is, what's this non-monotonic behavior of the inverse participation ratio? Why did it go up and then go down? Well, it turns out that the tail states are due to what's known as rare fluctuation effects. Specifically, in this case, the rare cluster, if you have a cluster of sites in which each of the diagonal energies happen to be at the edge of the distribution, W over 2 or minus W over 2, and within a bound which is equal to V, then you end up with a situation uh, which where the energy of the system can actually go outside W over 2. In fact, what you find is if you let this uh, chain go to infinity, which is the, uh, which each of them being at W over 2, then you find that there's an actual bandage at W over 2 plus 2V in, in, two, in, uh, in one dimension. And in any dimension you can show is W over 2 plus 2DV, where D is the dimensionality. Because all you've got is all sites at W over 2, and then uh, you have got an ordered problem, and you know what the bandage for the ordered problem is, which is exactly this. Yeah. Yes. Three dimensions. Yeah. Is it related to what you were saying? Because it's as if mobility it moves. Mo well, it has to move in. Yeah. Well, it, it is and it isn't. We don't know. We haven't done enough calculations in a three dimensional system. It, it requires a lot more effort than. Right now, we are just doing the 1D case. Because the box uh, situation is very strange. Mobility it moves out. And right. Moves yes. So, uh, it Gaussian is okay. Yeah. Uh, the well, even that, even if you look at the Gaussian, there is a little bulge. Yeah, lo well, Laurentian is, a, is the Lloyd model, which is, which is somewhat peculiar because it has no moments of the distribution. But can you rationalize this moving away of the uh, right. away from the band center? That's what you want to I'm, my picture shows <laughs> that that everything is everything is localized. This is finite. This is not uh, 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 you know the if you're talking about uh, the metal insulator transition, uh, we're talking about inverse participation ratio that are zero because they in the thermodynamic limit. This is finite in the thermo. So this is something happening in the insulating phase. It's not happening uh, because in one D it's only insulating. Yeah, no, there is, there's probably some relationship, which is something we need to think about. Uh, well, if we can get enough uh, power to do it. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, when you look at the one-dimensional case where there's only localized states, what you find is, of course, the energy band has sharp edges in the uh, uh, on original Anderson model, uh, which is given by this. And you can make a particle in a box argument to say where is the energy for finite length L, that is going to be this uh, edge uh, uh, minus EC plus order 1 uh, over L squared, or EC minus order 1 over L squared. So basically, as a function of energy, what is happening here is the actual bandage is at 4 and minus 4. Okay, it's W over 2 is 2 plus 2 uh, gives you 4, and this is a and uh, states here are coming from clusters that are very long, then it gets shorter and shorter, and uh, that's the ones that we can actually catch. To get something like this, we have to, is exponentially rare. Okay. The red curve would actually die, right? No, the, re the re no, red curve sees nothing of the, of, the, of the bandage, as far as we can tell. Actually, there is, the fluctuations in the Lyapunov exponent do seem to capture it, but not the Lyapunov, average Lyapunov exponent. Some 
Yes, yes, exactly. That's right. Good. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. The Lifshitz. Uh, okay. So these states, due to rare configurations coming from fluctuations of on-site energy, have support over L sites, but decay exponentially after that short length. So there are two length scales in the problem. There is one length scale which is the support of the wave function. Another length scale is the exponential decay beyond the support. And the Lyapunov exponent is finding the uh, exponential decay, whereas the inverse participation ratio is finding the support. And these two lengths are diverging. And they diverge completely at the, at the band edge. Okay. Now, the probability of having a configuration of length L in, in a, in a one-dimensional system turns, is exponential in this size of the system. It, you need all of them to be within V of W and all the L sites. So that's roughly of that order of magnitude, which you can see is an exponential in L. The density of states can be shown as a result to be of the form exponential EC minus E to the minus D over 2. So basically, uh, this exponential diverges at E, and it has an essential singularity. So the, the density of states is very, very little at the band edge. Okay. The inverse participation ratio, which goes as 1 over L squared, has a, square, has a uh, power law uh, behavior going to zero. And that is consistent with our data. If you look at this, uh, we have done more data, and then a square root behavior is consistent with what we have. Okay. In, more, in 2D, it should be linear, and we also confirm that. Yeah, OK. All right. In fact, you can look at that uh, inverse participation ratio as a function of size of the system that we diagonalize. This is the average inverse participation ratio. And you see that it doesn't depend very much. These are all strongly localized states. And so the uh, data only in this tail near the band edge is going to be, you know, you need these big sizes. But here, the inverse participation ratio is always, you know, this part of the curve is somewhere between 0.25 and 0.35. These are localized on three, four sites. They're not localized on too many sites. In fact, if you look at the data as a function of W, what you find is red is the inverse participation ratio, and the uh, blue is the density of states. There's very few states once you go beyond this curve, but at the curve, at this uh, place where we are finding this peculiar behavior beyond W over 2, the density of states is of order 1. It's not of order exponentially small. So this physics is continuing all the way up till there. And if you notice, even the density of states has some peculiar features, which um, we have some explanations for. Um, and if you plot the Lapinov exponent versus the inverse participation ratio for different values of w, you get curves that have, at least at large w, have two branches. One is a branch along this side that's at the center of the band. Then all of a sudden, the inverse participation takes a U-turn, and it gives you that branch. So one question you might ask is, you know, am I talking about exponentially few states here and, and you know, most of them there? Well, the next, uh, this is a blow up of that region where it fo forms. You notice that it, it actually seems pretty smooth and then develops a singularity as at a finite w, which, uh, which is something that we don't know, understand fully, but seems to be there in the numerics. If you look at the fraction of the states that are on the wrong side, on the second part of the curve, this part, that fraction is very negligible in the beginning for small w because there's hardly any, any of that curve. But then around 4, it takes a huge jump to about 17% and then decays. So these states are not that rare at all. They're 17% in 1D. In 2D, they're somewhat smaller, but still again, you know, off order 7, 8% in 3D, you know, maybe few percent there. So one can actually do numerics with this. When you have few percent uh, number of states, then you have enough statistical uh, information to be able to do things with it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. All kinds of things will affect it. Okay. This is for the Anderson model with a box distribution. Okay. You can also look at distribution of the inverse participation ratio. And what you, the only message I want to show you is that when you are, as you are increasing the energy and you are on the left side of that kink, uh, you have two kinds of states. These are the states with large, uh, with uh, 
with large inverse participation ratio about one, which is the typical Anderson state. And then there are a whole bunch of them with uh, inverse participation around two, and then some around three. I mean, one, you know, one half and one third. Uh, and as you go through that transition, the ones with on single sites disappear completely. And you are left with only states that resonate over two or three sites. And that's the transition that's happening. We've done a toy model with only two sites, Anderson model, where you can analytically ca calculate everything. You can calculate the density of states. You can calculate the inverse participation ratio for different Ws. That's the blue, uh, that's the solid blue curve uh, for the two site model. And the triangles are the nu numerical data showing that the numerics is perfectly fine. And as you increase the size of the system where we don't have analytics, this kink that exists persists. It changes in energy, so you can't get the critical one from the two-site model, but, but it still is definitely there. Okay. Uh, let me skip that side. It's not only the, uh, the box distribution. This is the triangle distribution, and again, you find that same kind of behavior. So this is just a distribution of on-site, which is, looks like a triangle. Uh, we tried it for a different W. Uh, we've tried singular distributions, ones which have singularities that are integrable around the edges. And then you find that actually the Anderson-like states, which have uh, Lyapunov exponent proportional to IPR, actually get eaten up by the Lifshitz-type states, which have anti-correlated uh, behavior. Uh, you put a Gaussian disorder, you see nothing. So all of it depends on having an edge in the distribution. Okay, it, it is crucially dependent on having a finite bandwidth of the disorder. Okay. You, you, do get tails you do get tails, but they all the stuff is, you know, the point is the, the point is whenever you have tails due to resonant states, there are also Anderson states there. And they are at the same energy. What is happening with finite bounded disorder is the resonant states are getting outside the Anderson band. And they're sort of splitting off like bound states from. So it's there in higher dimensions as well. This is the two-dimensional problem. Again, the same story. The inverse participation ratio has this very spectacular fast cu cu cusp. This is, again, this is in three dimensions, a cubic lattice. Again, the same story. Again, notice the Ws I've taken are very large because I need to get, in order to analyze, I need sh sh you know, fairly localized states. But we're pushing towards this boundary that has been found. And uh, I will. So let me then uh, give the concluding remarks for the second part. Uh, that though it's been around for f over 50 years, the Anderson model of localization continues to provide new interesting phenomena. We just had a book saying 50 years of Anderson localization. And I told Ellie, you missed the best thing. <laughs> uh, there, maybe there'll be a book <laughs> 100 years of Anderson localization too, <laughs> which will have all kinds of other results. Okay. So our results show that with disorder distribution with a cutoff, there is, appears to be a further demarcation of the localized phase into two distinct regimes, Anderson localized states and resonant states. That include the Lifshitz tails. This is separated by non-analytic behavior of these inverse participation ratio and density of states. The non-analyticity is captured by finite size analytic calculation. It's ultraviolet physics. It is not infrared physics. Okay. So then the question, of course, one might ask is, are bounded disorders make sense or not? Well, if you ask a chemist, the answer is yes. Because always these disorder distributions are coming from clusters of, of uh, atoms. And if you take any finite cluster of atoms, you always find that there's a minimum. And it's, an, uh, you know, it's not infinity. Okay, so these Gaussian disorders are figments of uh, math, you know, physicists who are pretending to be mathematicians. Uh, real distributions don't look like that at all. <laughs> binary all can be tried. It, it's a can of worms. There are many, many separate tricks from Anderson localized states to resonant states in that problem. There are so many of them that uh, I think it needs the patience of someone <laughs> who is really interested in numerics. <laughs> So with more singular distribution, for example, alloy disorder, the behavior appears richer with several points of time. The phenomenon occurs in all dimensions 
the phase space decreases with the increasing dimension as expected. There's no equivalent singularity of IPR seen with Gaussian disorder or any you know, disorder that has no cutoff. So the, the physics always seems to be that if you can pull, uh, you know, the specific kinds of insulating states that, that have different energies than, than the typical insulating states, you can get this physics out. And it's po possible to test the effects of these resonant states in optical uh, systems and probably also, uh, possibly also in engineered structures, but it really will require the experimentalist to be a good friend of the theorist. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. What you did is what correspond to uncompensated uh, uh, semiconductor. Yes. So, from your pictures, uh, it's looking uh, absolutely unambiguous that transition happens in the impurity band. While yeah. people arguing whether it is an impurity band or whether it is in conduction band. Yes. So, but I cannot even understand how in this picture one can have uh, something uh, to yeah. the con conducting band. Yes. The other I question is that you mentioned. Uh, Question is, what do you s what do you say about that? So, and why do they argue if it is mm. so clear? Mm. Uh, so, so uh, it's related. Namely, uh, at certain moment you mentioned valleys. Right. Now, uh, what I don't understand is the valleys, of course, property of the conduction band. Right. Now, when you make your uh, charge center and, and so on, what are you doing? It it is somehow. Uh, uh, originate from certain valley or then all this overlapping uh, between your different centers will be uh, quite uh, the specific uh, from what they originate or what you construct should make be some superposition of all of them. So all that is uh, not clear. So not clear. Okay, I, I will explain. They are both very, very good questions. Okay. So first question is um, whether the metal insulator transition takes place in the conduction band or the impurity band. In this picture, the conduction band has been removed. So it, it from the outset, assumes it's in the impurity band. They go, they yeah. Down, yeah. Right. Well, the question is to what extent the, uh, okay, my own personal picture uh, feeling is it will not change that much because uh, what will happen is that you need to orthogonalize the, as they evolve, you need to orthogonalize the conduction band states that remain to the impurity band states that you've kept. And generically, when you mix states, they, they repel. So that my guess is the conduction band will remain up and it will not really interfere. Of course, it will merge with the upper Hubble band very quickly. So in that sense, uh, I think that the, the transition being in the impurity band is, is a viable picture. It would be nice uh, to keep the conduction band if one can, but that increases the Hilbert space way too, more, too much. In fact, we are doing some calculations like that. I have an a undergraduate student from Oxford, Chris Warwick, where we have taken a simpler model where we didn't split the upper and lower Hubbard bands. We just kept one impurity band uh, and, and then asked the question. And we are finding that the, the met at the metal insulator transition, the states have very impurity-like character. And even 10 times beyond the metal insulator transition, they still have impurity-like character. So if you're looking at local probes, it looks impurity-like. If you do transport, it looks conduction band-like. Yeah, presumably, yes. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, magnetism is very different. Um, the second question, which is a very, uh, um, a very appropriate one, when I say multi-valley, or when we did it, Morris and I, we take a semiconductor that's a figment of our imagination, that we assume that there are many valleys. Uh, they're all spherical, so that there's only one hopping integral and all the rest of it. And the only way the valley enters the calculation is to say that the exchange interaction uh, potential is not important. And that you can show either in, you know, even at high densities, if you do local density functional calculations, you find that the number of valleys always reduces the exchange term. And so we are, um, if we did, um, okay, so here's the, let me go back, lots of slides, back to the front. We did try a little bit using Brinkman and Rice methods to estimate how much uh, 
effect the value business has, okay? And that's in the original calculation here. If you see, the single value band is somewhat uh, narrower than the multi-value band. And uh, the reason for that is that we have, uh, we have taken into account some sh band shrinkage, a la Brinkman and Rice, for uh, anti-ferromagnetic configuration of the, in, the, in the ground state. But uh, that's, uh, and that's, the, that's the extent of that, uh, uh, that effect. It's about a 20% reduction. But what it does is hardly changes the metal insulator transition density. So my guess is that, yes, these are complications which are going to affect the numbers, but it, they won't change the metal insulator transition density very much. They will change it by 20%, 30%. Uh, they are not going to change it by factor of two. So I think the factor of two needs another explanation. Yes. of the talk, a, a striking feature to me of one of the graphs you showed for the density of states in, in one of the Hubbard bands was how steep it got as a function of energy at some points. Yeah, that, no. So there are collective instabilities associated with the derivative of the, the density of states getting very large. Yeah. Is, it, is it conceptually consistent to think of then trying to field dope something at this impurity density into that region? Or would the calculation then not apply? Well, <laughs> when I put the electron-electron inter interactions in a big way, so I'm not sure that the one electron calculation will quite work there. No. Are we assuming a neutral system? Yes. We put phosphorus uh, in silicon. No. Uh, what? The the disorder property that that you know requires the stop sh steep cutoff that we're talking about. Um, you mean in the second part of the yeah. Part? yeah. Uh, positionally disordered system is that most of the disorder is in the off-diagonal term, not in the diagonal term. So this this physics is coming mostly from diagonal. In fact, uh, you know, a lot of disorder in the off-diagonal term will wipe out that uh, <laughs> that separation. Uh, it will smoothen it out. It doesn't mean that uh, that there isn't a uh, that Lipschitz type states are not predominantly in the, in the tail and uh, Anderson type states are not predominantly in the center, but, the, but this sharp demarcation will probably disappear if you do that. Um, uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, let me leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.